I'm ready. Trying to cut down on the glare from that big light. <sighs> Siege of Constantinople. The fifth wheel on the Art of Siege uh, games. The s &T magazine that kind of went to spark some interest. They were all sort of designed together at some point, but they diverged a lot. So, eh. Uh, this one gets a lot of flack. I suspect the rest of the series doesn't because people who really didn't like this didn't go out and buy the big soapbox of games they thought would be like it. Um, all of these quads ended up becoming very uh, valuable, but this one for whatever reason, skyrocketed in price, the Art of Siege Squad. Anyway, I, I almost suspect a bunch of copies of it were destroyed or something just because they couldn't sell it because of this, or maybe the, uh, the overall print run was much smaller than some of the others. I'm not sure. Anyway, like I said, this game was sufficient or maybe I didn't say. This game was sufficient for me to say, I want more like it. I can understand a lot of people not liking this game. Uh, or any of these Siege games, to tell you the truth. Because most of the game you're spending just pounding at the walls, which it, there's not a lot of decision making going on there, right? You know, it's, uh, this one's better than this one. It usually is pretty obvious. And it, it, it's not the kind of thing that you're thinking really clever, you know, stratagems about it. You have some, some ideas in mind. Some of them are brought out more to bear because of the mind planning. As you're tunneling, you end up, uh, you know, making these interesting choices as to, okay, do I want my tunnels to support my wall breaches or do I want them to be their own section. Over an acre that decision is very easy. Most of the decisions having to do with tunnels versus bombardment are pretty easy in that game. This one adds some interesting little tricky elements. First of all, you have two rows of wall you have to hit. Uh, one row right at the beginning which really isn't that necessary, but then the interior uh, set of walls, which you cannot cross unless you blast through it. And that's for most of the board, but not quite all of it. And then you have the interesting area near the blacker eye over here, where all you have is that front wall. The first wall, the one that you could actually scramble over if, uh, if, if it's not defended. An interesting topic for mines or uh, you have very powerful uh, artillery placed there at the beginning. Uh, Johannes Grant adds a lot of interest to that whole mining and artillery combination because the places where you're pounding with your artillery that's where he's gonna likely show up unless of course he's just hunting my, your tunnels and you decide well I don't really need you know I, I, I'm not as worried about the possibility of breaches in the walls this is a tough game and really all of them are to get sufficient breaches to feel like you can make an assault. I think it's very easy, like I've shown, uh, to maybe wait too long. The walls just have to be good enough. Uh, a few holes might be enough. You saw in the final, final stages of the last video that there were some breakthroughs. It wasn't a foregone conclusion. It was a close run thing at the end there. Well, what if I had done that right off the bat with the Janissaries? What if I had launched an attack before all the Byzantine troops were on the wall where they have to move things up? 
there was an early stage in the game, maybe even before I built the bridge, where the walls were in a pretty questionable shape, and that assault might have had a better chance of going over under those circumstances. I also had more troops available at that point. I hadn't wasted them on the earlier assault. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely can see very little to really recommend this game to the average person. I like it a lot. Uh, not a huge amount. I mean, it, it would never make, you know, oh, this is one of my favorite games. But sieges are hard to represent. Sieges are inherently kind of boring. Um, adding little things like the tunneling and stuff like that adds a level of interest, a little bit of uh, oh, suspense, you know, where, where is he? How, is he going to hit me? I, I'm so worried. When I'm playing this, as either side, I'm getting a kick out of it. I actually like being the guy uh, digging the mines better because I know everything and I can watch my opponent like screw up and I can see him thinking about going where I'm going and be like, oh man, I hope he doesn't, I hope he doesn't. And somehow I let off this nice like aura off that, maybe a reverse aura or something that gets them convinced that like I must be faking it or something. But very often people are not placing things and are not reacting to my digging, my secret maneuvers effectively at all. And whatever luck factor there is in that, it looks like they're doing very, very poorly on it. All right. Um, what about that naval expansion? I think for the game overall, Far and away, they did a great choice by leaving it out. It adds very, very little to the game. What it does add is a little bit of opportunity to kind of explore uh, what would happen if I tried a naval landing right away. The problem is the rules change for the naval landings to the point where you're not going to win the game with a naval landing. That might be the boost that throws you over, an extra five or ten points that you can slip in. But it's really almost not even important for the Byzantines to defend the coastline, especially where the rocky areas are. The hell with that. That's just a few points. Get your guys up on the walls as fast as you can. Of course, you can't get them there until either... Uh, I think it's like turn 15 they start showing up there. Or, over a period of, uh, after the uh, Ottomans attack, once they move up next to the wall, that frees everything. You still have these technical difficulties of actually getting them to the wall because you have to use your leaders to ferry them. But for the most part, any naval landing isn't really frightening. You have some opportunity to shift your guns to different locations, but the expense on that is fairly high. Um, so there really doesn't end up being a lot that at least I'm willing to do to change sort of that initial setup. But yeah, overall, I really am sort of enchanted by this. Pound the walls. Yeah, that's my new word for the week because last week somebody was enchanted with my dance. Uh, pounding uh, the walls. The choices in this one between the primary, the first layer of walls and the second more important layer. What I don't like about this one is the difficulty in moving the Byzantine units around. I'm sure it's a game balance thing that you need there, but it's an annoyance. Not quite on the scale maybe with uh, the simultaneous fire, how it works out in Tire Acre, but pretty close.
each of these games has its own little irritation. Now, not quite yet. But very soon we'll be getting to Leal and Sebastopol from the Art of Siege box. And those suckers, they change the game completely. They're a completely different paradigm. No longer worrying about this hex-to-hex -hex movement. More focused on that bring the walls down. What's nice, what I like about this one, and maybe still like it better than the other two earlier ones, is that this one is more about just bombarding the walls. And again, that's probably what made it so distasteful to so many people uh, is, yeah, I'm just rolling dice here, you know? Uh, why, why do I like this and not B-17? Well, I like the story here. B-17 just doesn't interest me in the same way. Uh, I, I can see the grand scope on this one. Ah, 